Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual forum event hosted by the Institute of Pub Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Pol Public Policy, known to many of you as GU Politics. My name is Grace, and I'm a rising sophomore in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics. I'm also the communications and marketing co-chair for the GU Politics Student Leadership Council this year. Throughout my time at Georgetown, I've had the amazing opportunity to serve on a student strategy team, visit the Iowa caucuses with the Hoyas and Iowa cohort, and to even run a student-run podcast called Fly on the Wall at GU Politics. As tonight's exciting event demonstrates, GU Politics is truly the place to be if you want to experience the best of both the political and the public policy and public service worlds. And so with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest for tonight. We are joined by four amazing White House Chiefs of, Chiefs of Staff. Mark McLarty, former Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton. Andy Card, former Chief of Staff to President George W. Bush. Pre uh, Dennis McDonough, former Chief of Staff to President Barack Obama. And Mick Mulvaney, former Chief of Staff to President Donald Trump. We are thrilled to have these esteemed panelists with us to discuss how presidents deal with national crises. And as always, please join us on social media using the hashtag COS at GU. This event will be moderated by Executive Director of GU Politics, Mo Lathy. And with that, I'll turn it over to him to kick off this conversation. Hey, Grace, thanks so much for that tremendous introduction. Uh, and for all of your leadership, you've made quite the mark both on GU Politics and the broader Georgetown community in a very short period of time so far. So looking forward to your continued involvement um, as, uh, as we get ready to kick off the next year. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in tonight, uh, both here in the, the Zoom chat, uh, members of the Georgetown community, but also the broader public who is following us on social media or other channels. Um, this is a really uh, timely conversation, I think. As we look at the world and the state of our politics right now, um, and the number of crises that we're all dealing with, uh, much of it falls at the doorstep of the Oval Office to be dealt with. And so to help us sort of sort through uh, how presidents think about this, we thought who better to convene than a team of, or a group of former chiefs of staff who have been there on the front line working arm in arm with the president of the United States, with the last four presidents of the United States in tackling various crises. These crises have come in all shapes, sizes, and forms, whether we're talking about military um, uh, action, whether we're talking about economic crises, terror attacks, natural disasters, or global pandemics. Uh, the, the guests on our panel tonight have, have seen it all, and so we're very fortunate to have them join us. We're gonna jump into the conversation in a moment, uh, but one piece of housekeeping. For those of you here in Zoom, members of the Georgetown community, you'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A tab. Uh, that's where you can go ahead and submit your question. Feel free to start submitting your questions now and throughout the entire program. Our team will be monitoring that tab. And about halfway through the program, after I've had a chance to, to talk with our panel for a little bit, we're gonna invite you to join the conversation. Um, so submit your questions at the, ta at the tab below. Keep an eye on the chat. Our team will let you know through the chat when we're ready to call you up, uh, and then you'll get a chance to ask your question directly. And so with that, um, I wanna thank all of the, our panelists again. Um, talked about each of you and each of the presidents you served had to deal with very, very different crises. They also, each of the four of them, had very unique and different leadership styles. And so let's just start there. And from your perspectives, having seen them up close and personal, what are the most important leadership qualities a president needs in order to deal with crisis? And why don't we start with, uh, with Mac? Well, Mo, first of all, I'm delighted uh, to be with you and my fellow chiefs here this afternoon. And Georgetown is special because our older son, Mark, graduated in 1995. School of Foreign Service, so he's a true Hoya, and we're proud of that. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be here today. I think in terms of crisis, in terms of presidential leadership, uh, at least with President 
when my sense was when we confronted with what Tom Brokaw used to call UFOs or seen occurrences, uh, when something would kind of zoom in, totally unexpected. I think President Clinton would first of all grasp that this was a serious issue, if not a potential or maybe an immediate crisis, something that had to be dealt with. At the same time, he wanted to get the fact quickly and mobilize a plan to deal with that. And he had a good ability to keep a broader perspective, to keep the broader agenda moving, because as each of the other very distinguished and accomplished panelists today know, that's the essence of any White House. You've got to keep the broader agenda moving forward while dealing with these issues. But I, I would say those are the real qualities that President Clinton exhibited in times of a major event or a major crisis. Andy, how about from your perspective? The president has to be an, an optimist, not a pessimist, and has to have the courage to make decisions. Uh, if, they, if they're a pessimist and they get up and make a decision that they say, follow me and things are going to get worse, no one will follow them. So you have to be an optimist and believe that you're making the right decision. But in making that right, direction, that right decision, understand that you can't do it alone. And if you're making a decision by yourself, chances are people will stop following you pretty soon. So optimism, having the courage to make tough decisions, and uh, the courage to seek counsel and advice and don't just ask an echo chamber to, to bounce back to you what you've already said. Make sure there are contrarians or people who will challenge you in the group, but have the courage to make that tough decision and do it optimistically so that people will have the courage to follow you. You know, a president doesn't get to imp implement any decision they make. It must be implemented by other people. And so uh, they can't just make a decision and walk away from it. They have to make a decision, be optimistic about it, so people will want to implement the decision and carry it out and help bring it so that the results live up to the president's expectation. Dennis? I'd say four things about crisis, uh, Mo. One is you got to know when you're in one. And uh, that's uh, sometimes a challenge. It, you know, you got to recognize what of the multitude of problems that a president confronts in any given day or week is actually one that's a crisis. And so you have to uh, be cognizant of uh, just how much um, damage a particular challenge uh, will present. That's one. Two, it's got to be really clear and communicate uh, with the country what you know and importantly what you don't know. Um, the country got to make decisions, as Andy says, uh, the president doesn't get to implement the decisions that he makes. And in fact, um, oftentimes he's trying to empower individuals to make decisions for themselves. And so for themselves. And so the challenge is communicating to them best available information based on science so they can make those decisions. Those, those decisions. Uh, and I said, I'll, I'll say four things, but I think I'll really just say three. The third is, when you're confronting a crisis, you want to make sure that you're uh, not creating a different crisis by losing track of all the other work the American people expect you to be undertaking. Uh, that really then comes down to the assignments for the chief to make sure that you're not playing a game of, you know, five-year-old soccer where everybody's chasing the ball down the field. In fact, you've got uh, the field covered. You've got um, the ongoing work uh, against other challenges fully underway, uh, but you also have the best available resources on the crisis. Uh, so those are the things I'd say, uh, Mo, and again, it's really good to be uh, with everybody at Georgetown there on the Hill. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, and then we'll turn to our other School of Foreign Service alum, uh, Mick. Thanks, Mo. Um, and it is really nice to be here, especially with uh, with other folks from the from the university. Um, as I was listening to everybody else talk, making some notes, and while all of it rang true, the part that I think speaks uh, to me most, having been through what we went through, was the part about how the president processes information. It was Andy who said, if you're making a decision by yourself, you 
probably making a decision that no one else has followed there, will follow, there's a corollary to that, which is if you're making a decision by yourself, it increases the chances of making the wrong decision. And I think if you're talking about qualities that the president or any leader has to have when you're in a crisis, is you have to be not only uh, able to, 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 to process information from a bunch of different sources, but willing to do so. I think that a lot of us get in circumstances where uh, we're tempted to simply react to something in the way we think we should react, as opposed to sort of step back and say, okay, I need information from this source, this source, and this source. I think some of the things that, uh, that Dennis just said is that uh, um, you, you are able to sort of, or actually it was Andy, I think, to get folks who are contrarian to your natural position. So if you're dealing with foreign policy, for example, and your natural position would be, say, neoconservative, do you have somebody else in there giving you the other opinion uh, or another angle on things? Um, one of my favorite stories from history is it goes to the mistakes that the Kennedy administration made in the Bay of Pigs, um, where they ended up in that classic example of groupthink, where everybody was thinking the same thing and it ended up taking them down a road that maybe they would not have gone down if, uh, if they had input from other sources. So the processing of information, while, while always important to a president or any leader, becomes extraordinarily uh, important when you're dealing with crises. And you have to stick to the, the process that the chief has created, and hopefully the president has empowered to make sure that the president is getting all of the information they need um, to make the right decision. I want to ask each of you now to sort of put some of those into practice for us and shed some light on how they were put into practice and ask each of you, um, you, you each had to deal with a multitude of crises, um, but I'm going to uh, list one for each of you and ask you to take us inside the room to the extent that, that you can. Take us inside the room and tell us, you know, when crisis broke and you had to tell the president, I'm curious of a couple of things. One, um, what was the first question he asked? Two, um, what were your initial marching orders um, and uh, over the next, the next couple of weeks? Um, and so, Mac, I'm going to come back to you. you you had to deal with a couple in the beginning but I think a lot of people um, uh, would would be well served to remember that one of the very first things you had to do you were in office for about five weeks when the first World Trade Center bombing happened right uh, you guys barely had time to find the light switches um, talk us through that when when it happened what was the first thing, what was the first question President Clinton asked to, to the best of your recollection? And what were your initial marching orders? Well, I think you're exactly right. I think particularly when you're coming in in a new administration, you are so focused right after the campaign on the president's agenda. You have just been through a campaign, got your priorities set, but you have to be aware have to be aware that there inevitably going to be these kinds of dramatic, shocking, unexpected events happen. And certainly the World Trade Center, uh, you're right, only a few weeks after we were in office, was that kind of event. We were fortunate, uh, unlike Andy when he was traveling with President Bush 43, President Clinton was in the White House that occurred. So immediately you make sure he was safe and secure and with the Secret Service and so forth. We, we immediately were able to confirm that. Secondly, was just trying to get the facts, what had happened, and report that to the president in a coherent, real-time manner. And I think it goes to what many others have said, uh, and it's alluded to it. You've got to immediately draw the circle outside the White House, in this case, clearly, Bob, immediately the FBI, the Justice Department, and other agencies. Uh, so I think when we first briefed the president, his first question was, how many people were injured or killed? Do, what do we know about it? Who did this? Uh, are there any anticipated follow-up future concerns that we need to immediately address? And what's the plan? That, that was basically his, his initial response in the room in the Oval Office. And we were able to mobilize pretty quickly in that regard. And I can't remember the exact days, but I think it was less than a week 
when the FBI really was able to apprehend uh, those perpetrators of, of this uh, uh, very, you know, very heinous uh, act. And so in our case, that was a, an immediate, uh, immediate issue that captivated us for the 48 to 72 hours uh, when we got things in place to track it in a way to deal with it. Uh, I think part of that, finally, more quickly, is the communication. Uh, exactly what Dennis talked about. Make sure you're communicating the facts you know, what's happening, but make certain you don't step over the line and get into conjecture. Uh, or much less political spend. Uh, I think we were able to do that reasonably well. Again, in our case, we had a, a pretty quick resolution uh, of this situation. Thanks, Mac. Andy, um, we all saw the moment that uh, the president found out about the second World Trade Center uh, tower being hit on 9-11 when he was in that classroom in Florida and you had to walk up to the front and whisper in his ear uh, and he had to sit there for a little bit longer. When he came off stage uh, and retreated to the room that you had backstage, um, tell us about that. What was his first question and what were your initial marching orders? I'm gonna back up a little bit because uh, when he walked into the classroom all that he had been told by the acting national security advisor on the trip, a Navy captain by the name of Deb Lauer, who was, ran the White House Situation Room, she just said, sir, it appears a small twin-engine prop plane crashed into one of the towers at the World Trade Center in New York City. And that's what he knew when he walked into that classroom. He and the principal walked into the classroom. I stood by the door. The door shut after he entered the classroom. I'm standing there. Captain Lauer comes up to me and tells me, sir, it appears it was not a small twin engine prop plane, it was a commercial jetliner. And then a nanosecond later, she comes up and says, oh my God, another plane at the other tower at the World Trade Center. And then I stood at the door and I had to perform a test that Mick has had to perform, Mac has had to perform, Dennis has had to perform. Does the president need to know? And chiefs of staff deal with that all day long. And sometimes you get it right and you tell him something he should know. Sometimes you get it wrong and you tell him something he shouldn't know and he worries about it. Or sometimes you get it wrong, you don't tell him at all, and then you're in deep trouble. So at this point, I made the decision to pass on the information. I thought carefully about what I would say. And when I whispered into his ear, all I said was, a second plane hit the second tower. America is under attack. I did not invite a question from him. In fact, I stood back from him so that he couldn't ask a question. I presumed there was a boom microphone hanging over, over him and everything would be heard, so I didn't want him to talk to me. So unlike Mac walking into the Oval Office, uh, I was not looking to have a conversation with the president. I just passed on that information, and I didn't even know if he would get up or stay there. I was pleased how he reacted. He stayed there. He did nothing to scare those young kids, did nothing to demonstrate fear to the media that would have translated it to the satisfaction of the terrorists all around the world. But I'm also pleased because I got to go back into the holding room and get things ready for him. So what did he say when he walked into the holding room? Well, first, I want to say what I said when I walked into the holding room. I said, Get the FBI director on the phone. Get a line open to the vice president. Get a line open to the White House Situation Room. Get the crew back on Air Force One. We're going to have to get out of here. To the Secret Service, I said, get ready to move the motorcade. We're going to have to get out of here. To Dan Bartlett, the communications acting director on the trip, I said, get some remarks written for the audience that we have in the gymnasium. He has to say something to them, but he can't say anything we do not know to be the truth. The president walked in. Everybody glommed on the president the way they always do when they walk in the room. Mr. President, Mr. President. And the first thing he says, get the FBI director on the phone. It was Bob Mueller. He'd only been on the job for 10 days, but Bob Mueller was on the phone. So you have to get, anticipate what the president needs and get it done. And then he was very focused. He called the governor of New York, the mayor of New York City. He talked, obviously, to the national security team back at the Washington, D.C., Condi Rice and Dick Cheney and the NSC team. And I then worked to be very disciplined. I decided I was going to be cool, calm, and collected the entire day and serve him. 
and try to prevent people from getting him ginned up or emotionally engaged when it wouldn't help him make tough decisions. And so that was that, was that moment. And to his credit, he was uh, outstanding at making decisions. He did not rush to make decisions, but he tried to make an informed decision, but he knew he had to make some decisions. And the first time I remember grimacing was when he was speaking to the audience just before we were going to go get in the limousines and leave, head off the Air Force One. And I had told Dan Bartlett to be very careful with the remarks that were written. He opens his comments saying, I'm going to have to go back to Washington, D.C. And then he proceeds to tell him what was going on. I was upset because I knew we might not be going back to Washington, D.C. And I was a little mad at Dan Bartlett. I thought that he had written that in the remarks. It turns out Dan didn't put it in the remarks. The president just said he was going back to Washington, D.C. So the real, the first significant argument I had with the president on the 9-11 was on Air Force One, where he said we were going back to Washington, D.C. The pilot said, I don't think you should go there. The Secret Service said we can't go there. Uh, we weren't ready to go there. And he and I had this argument. It was a tough argument to make. I kept saying, I understand that you want to make that decision. I just don't think you want to make it right now. I kept repeating that. I understand that. I think you want to make that decision. I just think it's too early to make that decision. And he kept saying, I'm, I am making the decision right now. And I had to hold my ground and know that I was serving at the pleasure of the president, but it was not my job to please him. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Dennis, before you were chief of staff, you still played a very important role in the administration at the National Security Council as the deputy national security advisor. And it was in those final months of 2012, um, before the reelection and before you then took over and chief of staff, that President Obama had to deal with a pretty significant crisis uh, with the attack in Benghazi. Um, and so putting on your NSA uh, or NSC hat, excuse me, your NSC hat. Um, wondering if um, you could walk us through those initial moments, the and how the President Obama processed that information, what his first questions were, and your marching orders. Great, uh, Mo. Thanks, and uh, I have to say, um, every each each time I've had the honor or the and the pleasure to hear that um, story from Andy. I'm just reminded of what a pro uh, he is and uh, what a remarkable bit of service uh, he's done over the course of his life, uh, but in particular in those very difficult days um, on 9-11 and after. And so, Andy, I just want to say um, uh, thank you for that and hand it off to you. Uh, well, I, I do remember that day uh, quite well. Uh, Mo, it was September 11th, 2012, and I'm walking uh, to the Oval where uh, President Obama and Vice President Biden were getting ready uh, for their weekly meeting with Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, and we were starting to get information developing uh, from Benghazi. And you may recall that uh, we weren't quite sure uh, what prompted the attack on our people in the first instance. Um, and so we are both uh, trying to get ground truth in terms of what was happening, but also get um, start to develop information about motive for the attack and what it might mean for follow-on attacks, both in Benghazi, but then as against other of our facilities throughout the region. Uh, you'll recall that throughout 2011 and 2012, in the tumult of what was then called the Arab Spring, we had several of our diplomatic presences in Tunis, in Cairo, in Juba, in Damascus, uh, come under some significant threats and significant violence. And so we were trying to identify precisely what was happening uh, in Benghazi, but then also make sure that we understood what was happening uh, and might be happening against other 
facilities in the region and, and our people in the region. That, th this goes back to um, a point that, my next point will go back to a point that both Mick and Mac and Andy have made, which is that in as much as the president was then sitting down with the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he was in a position then uh, to give very clear guidance, or as you say, marching orders, Mo, uh, to Secretary Panetta and to Chairman Dempsey. And so uh, he made clear uh, that he wanted to make sure that we could get uh, as much material and as much support as we could to Benghazi uh, in rapidest, in, in most rapid fashion. Um, and that he expected to be, uh, that they would stay in touch with him then over the course of the rest of the night um, as this unfolded, which they did, um, and which then we took back to the National Security Advisor Suite. Uh, and working with Tom, we sort of stood up uh, a kind of interagency coordinating mechanism that each of the other three ch chiefs are very familiar with, and uh, which we then coordinated activity on for the rest of that evening and into the next day. Um, so it's a, a perfect example of having imperfect information, um, having great connectivity with our people, but then ultimately also being under uh, what our military and others commonly refer to the tyranny of distance, which is how do we get best available information from the point of crisis and then how do we get best available resources and capability to the crisis. And that's what we worked on throughout that night. Mick, before we go to you, I want to um, harken back uh, to something that Dennis said earlier, which was one of the important qualities, one of the important things you need to do in crisis is identify when you are in crisis. And looking at the COVID crisis that we're dealing with now, and that President Trump uh, is faced with. Unlike the other three examples we just heard, there wasn't a singular moment when it was suddenly clear that America was under attack. Um, this is something that had been percolating and, and escalating. And so my question to you, the slight variance from how I uh, asked the other chiefs, is um, at what point did the Trump administration know that COVID had become a crisis? And what was that initial suite of, uh, or what was the initial information that President Trump demanded? Uh, and then sort of those initial marching orders at that point. Yeah, it's funny you say that because that's exactly, I was thinking that when you're, when, especially when Dennis was talking, um, that the COVID crisis, we, we didn't know it was a crisis at the outset. Why is that, by the way? Uh, by the way, in your original question was, what was the first conversation? I honestly don't remember the first time that I talked with the president specifically about COVID. It would have been um, sometime in January, and it would have been a list of five or six things that we covered on a particular day. Um, we knew something was happening in China, so we would have mentioned it to him early on, but um, there was no instant sort of that, that when the light bulb went on and said, okay, now we talk about this. Um, we had, and Dennis just used the words, imperfect information, which I think is going to be a big part. When they write the history of, of the COVID crisis and our response to it, that will be a big part of it. Um, early on, what we thought we were dealing, well, we knew what we were dealing with, which was a coronavirus. By the way, there have been others. There's two that the folks on this call will probably be familiar with, SARS and MERS were both coronaviruses. We had some experience with those. And when we watched what was happening in China and we knew it was a coronavirus, um, we didn't know much more about it than that. Keep in mind the Chinese were not sharing information with us at that time. And back in hindsight, we really didn't know a lot of, we didn't have a lot of good information about this virus until late February by the time it got to Italy. But early on, um, we know it's a coronavirus. And what do we know about coronaviruses? Well, we knew about SARS and MERS, which were extraordinarily deadly in terms of their fatality rate. The flu is about 0.1% deadly in a given year. It looks like uh, right now COVID-19 is someplace in the realm of 0.5% deadly. Uh, SARS was 16% deadly. Uh, MERS was even worse, about 32 or 33% deadly. Um, this is, that's a major, major difference. But we knew, we, we thought we had another coronavirus 
that was really deadly, but fairly hard to transmit. And so what we were doing early on was, was spending our time trying to focus on containing the disease and keeping it out of this country, as opposed to mitigating it, which is what we're doing now. Um, containment is when you, you instill border checks, you, you, you cancel flights and so forth. Mitigation is social distancing and mass and closing schools and so forth. Um, but if you ask the question in that continuum, when we knew this was going to be different, um, it was sometime around um, late February when it was in Italy, and we just started getting information about asymptomatic transmission. Because up to that point, um, we had been doing screening. For example, early on in the crisis, we, 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 we uh, limited the number of airports you could come into from China. Um, and then when you were at those particular airports, we would screen you for symptoms. Were you coughing? Were you hacking? Were you, did you have a fever? Those types of things. That's, that's how we know to do containment. And I remember at some point along the time when the, the Italian outbreak was, was in its very first days, they came in and announced, um, we think we have a problem with asymptomatic transmission. And that's when it changed in our minds because what we were doing um, was aimed at SARS and MERS, but it was clear at that point that this disease was, was going to be different. And if I can give you the disease when I don't have a fever and I'm not coughing, then screening for passengers at airports is a really, it, 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 it almost is useless. It, it won't catch. If you're looking for symptoms and you, you can get somebody sick without, symptom, without symptoms, you've got a problem. And I do remember going and talking to the president, um, and we went in as a group, which I thought was important. Um, a lot of the stories you've, you've talked about, I think Andy's particularly that very iconic photograph, it's, him, it's, the, it's the chief and the president. Um, we, we always went in as a group on these big issues with the president because that's how he liked to take information. And he wanted to pepper people with questions. And when we sat down with him, uh, I can't, again, I can't remember the date, that said, Mr. President, this is going to have to change. And he asked why, and it was Fauci, and I think it was Redfield actually delivered that particular piece of information. And that's when we knew we had to change. I don't remember what the particular marching orders were. That's when we started talking about a more formal coronavirus task force. I think by that time we had already stopped flights from China, um, but we, we kicked into higher gear in terms of, of preventing people from coming in. But that is the, that's the one take where I remember from that crisis was that it was a slow sort of simmering thing we were operating with, with bad information about what the disease was, and we got that one piece of information that had to change the way we were dealing with the crisis. And that's when we switched from containment um, to mitigation. Um, I don't know if that's a really good answer to your question, but um, it, it does go to show that uh, not all crises are instantaneous. Um, sometimes you have them and you don't know it. Sometimes you think you have them and you don't. But in that particular circumstance, we had it uh, and didn't know it for a variety of reasons. I have so many more questions on my list, but we're going to turn to the students in, in a moment. Um, and then I may uh, exercise moderator's uh, discretion and interject a little bit. So students, get ready. We're going to start coming to you uh, in a moment. Before we do, though, I want to ask one last question during this portion to um, reflect on something that both Dennis and, and Mick said, and that is sort of the, the challenge of dealing with um, changing information and evolving information and how that poses a real communications challenge during crisis for a White House. As information changes, as you get more information in real time, I suspect each of you have had to deal not just with changing information, but a changing message or changing narrative or changing guidance that you're giving to the American people. And the challenge that causes, I think, with um, sort of dealing with the importance of communications uh, in crisis. So I'm just wondering if any or all of you would like to sort of deal with that. How do you deal with managing the operational challenges ahead of you and communicating effectively with the American people as information is changing? Right after the attacks on 9-11, first it was the World Trade Center, then it was the Pentagon, then there's a plane crashing into the Shanksville, Pennsylvania. So there wasn't a lot of information and there was expectation that other attacks were gonna happen. So you, you're getting people hy hyperbole. 
this, watch out for this, watch out for that. And that, that happened almost on day one. But then on the subsequent days to September 11th, you have to remember we also had the situation where we had the anthrax letters being mailed around in Washington, D.C., and Florida, and New York City. And then we had uh, a, a snipe, a white van with a sniper roaming the streets of Maryland and Northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. So there was a lot of paranoia and a lot of bad information. And the president is frustrated on what is the information? What, is, what do we tell people? And, and especially in the greater Washington community, there was legitimate fear that people had. And the president was trying to address that fear, but he didn't feel comfortable about the information that we're getting. I'll give you another example that's completely more absurd since chiefs of staff deal with crises all the time. The question is, are they a real crisis? But for people who come hyperventilating to your office, they're a crisis. Jim Jeffords is getting ready to switch parties. And you know, all of a sudden you have to negotiate with the Democrat leadership in the Senate rather than Republican leadership when you're trying to get something done and you've only been in office for five months. Or when we were down in Mexico, the first trip that President Bush had out of the country was to Mexico, and uh, the military takes out a radar system in Iraq because Iraq had violated the no-fly zone. And so that interrupts a diplomatic thing. Is that a crisis? Then you have the EP3 incident with Hanan Island and an American plane getting bumped by a, a Chinese plane. The Chinese plane crashes into the water. The pilot dies. Our plane is badly damaged. It flips over, and then it flies into Hanan Island. And is there going to be a big incident with the Chinese? Those all happen in the first 50, 60 days of a presidency. So you're dealing with crises all the time. But having the sense that you <clears throat> know that you need good information is kind of the chief of staff's job to, to reinforce the need for people not to present information that they are not certain about. It doesn't mean you shouldn't present the information, but you could not present it as a certainty and, and allow for people to find out what the truth is and make the decision if the best you can around the truth rather than around the expectation. Anyone else want to jump on in this? Look, I, I think one of the really important things is structure on how you communicate, because I think as your question envisions, and as Andy has just said, information is going to change. And you, you have to uh, maintain your credibility with the American people to trust what you say, even when uh, the best available information changes. And so consistency is not what you're looking for. Uh, what you're looking for is fidelity to what you understand and fidelity to the best available science, for example. And so uh, I think uh, one of the things that we regularly would do around a crisis is we'd set up a communication schedule and we'd make sure that we identified the principal communicator on an issue. So around Ebola, for example, uh, we would have a very regular briefing led by the medical professionals so that they could give directly to the American people best available information informed by the science. And we'd put those, we'd schedule those briefings on a very regular basis so that the press knew what to expect, the American people knew what to expect. And that also forced a discipline on the team and on the government to prepare best available information for each of those appearances. And, you know, so what, what you wouldn't want to do in a crisis is have the identified time and location for the scheduled briefing come and not be in a position to brief because that would lend a sense of further crisis to the American people a sense that perhaps we are scrambling to get information and therefore uh, not credible in the presentation of the information that we had. So having a very clear, transparent schedule for briefings, making very clear who the briefer would be and having those briefers operating off of, uh, in the context of Ebola, for example, 
off of the best available science uh, and having those be best available science scientists and doctors making the briefing, I think lends a degree of credibility uh, even when you're forced to address a changing situation and therefore forced to provide uh, different information, even contradictory information over. Um, oh, I, all right. Yeah, go ahead, Mac. Real quickly, I think that the ballot you're trying is you, these crises require a certain degree of humility standing. You're, you're not always going to get things perfect right the first time. But that cannot freeze you in place. You have to act, you have to be decisive. But at the same time, it's just imperative not to go too far in terms of your communication. You can leave yourself some room there. I think the other important fact on the Oklahoma City bombing, which is another crisis, is to have really strong communication, in this case with Governor Keating of Oklahoma, who was absolutely a crucial interlocutor in that situation. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mick, I'd love for you to get in on this too, but I wanna go to the student question, so I'm gonna find a way to connect this question to one of the coming student questions. So let's do this, let's go to our first student. Uh, as we call on each of you, um, I'm going to uh, ask you to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, school, field of study, where you're Zooming in from, uh, and, and, and year, um, and then uh, get right to your question. Okay, so first question comes from Aida. Hey. Hi, my name is Aida. I'm a rising junior in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics, um, and I'm Zooming in from South Florida. Uh, my question is... Sometimes um, crisis management strategies are strongly divided along partisan lines, as we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so I'm wondering, how do you navigate partisanship disagreements in a time of crisis and manage the political impacts of potentially making choices that don't align with your own party's messaging? Anyone want to take a crack at that first? I'm happy to take a first uh, crack. Um, and try to beat Andy to the punch there, because he always don't you think, Mac? Andy's always willing to jump, jump in there and uh, mix <laughs> he, it up. I practice, uh, practice tendency to do that. It's a good thing. <laughs> um, I think uh, maybe this sounds uh, Pollyannish, um, but as with all this communication, all you have is your credibility, and so what you need to do is uh, say what you know and be consistent with best available data and best available science. And the moment you're gonna lose your credibility is when you start saying one thing to one group, perhaps your partisans, and another thing to a different group, perhaps the opposition party. And if you find yourself in that uh, position, you're not gonna be able to First of all, you know, I forget who said it, but, you know, the problem with lying is it's hard to remember all the lies. Uh, but the, the issue is if you're, if you're trying to spin your understanding of the crisis for a particular audience, you're going to quickly lose track of the facts, and then you're going to quickly lose the trust and the credibility uh, with not only your interlocutors, but also then with the American people who at the end of the day, in a lot of these crises, these really what you're trying to do is communicate to the American people so that they can make best available, uh, that they can make best decisions for them and their families based on the information that you're giving to them. And I mean, look, South Florida is a perfect example given all the natural disaster, annual hurricane season, hurricane exercises that you guys live through. If, if the governor or if the FEMA director or if the president gets in a position where he or she is giving one message to a, a particular audience for political purposes and giving a different message to a different audience, I think you'll quickly lose the credibility that's so important to maintain your uh, position as an effective leader and effective. Let me, let me ask a quick follow-up question. Um, and this is where I'll, I'll pull Mick in. Um, and, and it relates directly, I think, to Aida's question. I mean, the polling right now seems to show a huge partisan divide in how people are viewing the, the crisis, the legitimacy of the crisis, 
the how how the magnitude of the crisis and of course the response of the government to the crisis and i'm wondering if you can reflect on that a little bit and whether or not going back to my last question some of the communications um uh, the very unique communication style of this president um uh how that's maybe connected to this yeah uh, in fact i was sitting here making some notes on partisanship and it's listen let's be let's be candid let's be honest right that's what the purpose of this is let's have a fair discussion it's getting harder and harder to to operate in a bipartisan fashion and i think one of the things you're seeing by the way i have a theory i could be wrong about this but i often believe that one of the reasons our government is so divided is that the nation is that the government tech typically is a is a lagging indicator not a leading indicator it's that the, the, the country is not divided because its government is the government is divided because the country is and i think social media plays a great uh, role in that to so, aida i would say look it's it's hard to be bipartisan when everybody gets their news for example they, 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 you don't turn on fox news for the news you don't turn on msnbc for the news you turn those channels on to be affirmed in what you already think the truth is to begin with one of the biggest challenges i have a private citizen now is who, who where, where do i go to get good data one of the great things about being in the white house is you get really really good first-hand primary data, in fact, probably the best in the world. But now that I'm out, I'm a private citizen. Where can I go to get information that I think is not been filtered in such a fashion as to draw it uh, into some question? So I think it's going to be hard. I would like to think, Aida, that um, if we had another 9-11, God forbid, tomorrow, that we would respond in as bipartisan way as we did in 2001. But it would be much harder to do so. All of those but take 2001, all those fringe theories that you heard a little bit about, those would be amplified. Those would be on social media. There'd be thousands of people, if not tens of thousands of people talk about it. It would filter its way into some, some network program someplace, depending on whether or not it was pro-administration pro or anti-administration. Going to be more and more difficult to respond in a bipartisan fashion as we go forward. It's one of the challenges that we face. Mo, you and I have talked about the importance of civil discourse. Um, and the ability to, to not only agree disagreeably, but to share information and not go into a conversation trying to convince everybody else you're right, actually have a conversation trying to, to figure out if you can be better in your own thinking. Uh, but it's going to be a big challenge, um, and it will, your generation will struggle with it even more so than we did. Face it, I mean, um, I think Mac is Mac. Did, in the, so social media didn't exist. I think up. At, I mean, I don't think it played much role in the Obama administration, but for the elections and maybe the last couple of years. But President Clinton didn't have to deal with social media. Can you imagine what the what 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 that that um, what the what that impeachment crisis would have been with social media? I mean, President Bush didn't have to deal with social media. President Obama did a little bit, and now we're on it. We're in full bore. So that's a long answer. I apologize for that, but I think that's a real challenge that we face as a culture. We are. Um, uh, thanks. We are uh, getting close, and I want to try to squeeze in at least a couple more uh, student questions. So. Let's go to Katie next, and then maybe toss this one to Mac and Andy to take first crack at. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm an incoming first year in the School of Foreign Service and wanted to ask what role media plays in managing crisis with public perception and how this role has changed from old media such as print to new media with television and social media. Yeah, I don't think there's any question, Katie, that Media plays a big role in crisis. Mick's already uh, given a, a pretty good tutorial on social media and how times have changed for sure. But I think we saw that back in the Clinton administration many, many years ago. Even with CNN, it was the first time, as Secretary Warren Christopher said, he would arrive at a Capitol and the visiting head of state to be with knew more about what had happened in the past 12 hours in the United States than perhaps he even did in, in some ways at least. So it has just accelerated the cycle. And look, the old adage, picture's worth a thousand words. When people see that on social media, they see a situation developing, they identify with it, they're concerned about it, information goes out, and you have to deal with that and have to respond to it. Um, we had a different, different dynamic, but even then, 
the news cycle was getting more and more accelerated. And I think we had more retraction printed in, in 1993 than it had ever been printed before because everybody was get the scoop, get the story. So that's only accelerated, whether it's in times of crisis or political tooling and throwing. You, you ask a very good question. It's, it's so absurd. I started working at the White House for President Ronald Reagan in 1983. And I remember at about 4.30, 5 o'clock in, in the afternoon, there would be an announcement that went over a PA system, went, went through the entire Eisenhower Executive Office building, which was in the old Executive Office building. And it would say, the lid is on, the lid is on. That meant no more news that day because all the reporters had to go to their editors and get ready for the seven o'clock news and the overnight and check with their, argue with the editor about their sources and all this kind of stuff. But the White House staff said, phew, the day is done. No more news, perfect. And so I watched that evolution during the Reagan administration where radio talk shows came into being and then cable news and they had to have new news all the time and the rules changed so the journalism didn't mean you had to have sources you just had to have have people with good rumors and if you could get a good rumor and somebody would respond to it it was newsworthy so big change social media has changed it dramatically since george w bush left office and and i don't know how to deal with it today but the greatest threat to democracy aristotle and plato told us to john adams the greatest threat to democracy is mob rule Right now, the mob is motivated by social media. And the truth is, some of the leaders of the mob are in government. So they mobilize a network that is like a mob, and they influence how government makes decisions. It's very important that, that we learn how to have leadership that has the courage to, I, as my grandmother would say, taste your words before you spit them out. If you're very careful with your words as president, if you're very careful with your words as chief of staff inside the White House, other people will be careful with their words. And it's the hyperbole and the emotionalism that's generated through the media today that causes people not to be objective in making decisions. And it does influence Congress because today, it used to be you'd write a letter to a member of Congress and it would take a week for it to get there and a staffer would open up, read it, and maybe brief the member. Uh, then there were phone calls and very few phone calls made it to the member of Congress. They were screened through a staff. Now tweets are sent to a member of Congress immediately by a constituent. They read it and say, I agree with you. They send a, a response right back and then they find out that the original tweet wasn't necessarily true. But the greatest sin in politics is to be a flip-flop. Say, I agree with this and then change your mind. So they get stuck on stupid. So we've got a government today stuck on stupid. And it, objectivity is very hard for us to get through. But it, it's key to those of you who are in this generation, and I'm in yesterday's generation. This generation, have the courage to be careful with your words and try not to make decisions based around an emotional response or guidance that comes through a tweet. Uh, be skeptical of a tweet and seek the truth and then make your decisions based around that. I didn't mean to lecture you, but it's a different world. And our democracy is going to be challenged, Katie. And I'm counting on you to have the courage to be a filter so that you're not driven by emotions. You can be informed by emotion, emotions, but our founding fathers said, let's separate the mob from the people who have to make decisions so that they will make decisions based on judgment and wisdom. And the expectation was Congress would exercise judgment, the Senate would ex exercise a little bit more wisdom and challenge the judgment, and then it would go to the president and the president would have to make a decision, yes or no, on a bill. Now, emotions and not being uh, able, or, or not being called a flip-flopper, if you've made it, if you've announced your decision and you change your mind, you violated a rule of politics. And I would like people to be careful before they made their decisions so that they exercise judgment, made an informed decision, and then had the courage to teach other people what that decision should be. Sorry to be, I sound like a preacher. My wife is a preacher. I'm sorry. <laughs>
Yeah. Andy, I thought that was great. Mo, I hope they're still teaching Plato at Georgetown. I don't know if it's in the canon or not, but he's absolutely right. You can go back thousands of years, and there's warnings against direct democracy, what he called mob rule. And that's where social media is taking you. There is no more filter that, that Plato that contemplated that between the masses and the decision-making. So anyway, that's – Andy, that was – that's – that. thank you. I, I enjoyed that very much. That, that was, I'm an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we're getting really close to the end, but if you'll all indulge me, I want to get one more student question in, if we can. So uh, let's go to, uh, is it Adeline? Adeline? Yes, uh, Adeline DeYoung. I'm a rising third year student in the evening program in the Masters of Public Policy at Georgetown. Uh, so my question is, do you view that part of responding to a crisis is the opportunity to bring about larger change? And if yes, how did you try to act on that? Dennis, you want to take this one first? Uh, yeah, I mean, so um, Rahm Emanuel was our uh, first chief of staff. Um, he was shorter. Um, but he, he had a theory uh, that he said, uh, you, you don't want to waste uh, a good crisis as an opportunity where you have the full attention of policymakers and the country to ensure that you can kind of make a big correction if um, the country, in fact, needs a big correction. And so um, that's surely, I think, how he as chief of staff and as how the president uh, approached that period of uh, 2000 and nine and 2010 when uh we're managing through the great recession and, and trying to ensure that we were learning lessons from that recession and what got us into it such that we are better positioned to avoid going back in to recession for based on the same reasons and so that led to a lot of uh big legislation uh, like the Dodd-Frank Act, which just uh, marked an anniversary here uh, just last week that related to regulation of our banks and non-traditional um, instruments in our banks like derivatives that had surely an impact on the recession in 2007 and 2008. Um, or, um, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, uh, which sought to have private citizens have some protection against the kind of um, uh, tomfoolery in financial markets that put them at risk without the kinds of protections that big banks uh, and big investors had, which surely contributed to the recession. And then ultimately even the Affordable Care Act, for example, which tried to, in light of the number of people who were forced onto the private market, having lost their jobs as a result of the recession, we tried to correct some of the fundamental unfairnesses in the private market. Things like women, because of gender rate, being charged more than men. Uh, people with pre-existing conditions, uh, not being able to buy health insurance on the private market. So each of those crises does present an opportunity where I think if you are a, a serious policymaker, you want to ask yourself, what are the lessons to learn from this crisis? How do we correct what needs to be corrected so that we don't find ourselves back in a similar crisis as a result of uh, things that we could have changed when we had the opportunity to? Thanks, Dennis. We are just about out of time. Um, one of the things I really appreciate, um, uh, and I think this conversation has uh, demonstrated, is just how collegial the Chiefs of Staff Club is um, and how much mutual respect there is for one another. Um, and so in closing, I want to ask each of you, if you could, as sort of parting thoughts, in a couple of sentences most, at most, what advice would you give to the newest member of this club? Mark Meadows, 
as he sits there now and tries to work with President Trump in dealing with sort of these triple crises of COVID, um, the uh, unrest around uh, uh, racial injustice, and a faltering uh, economy. Um, what advice would you give him and through him to President Trump uh, as we continue through this summer? Um, and so let's start with Mac and work our way down the line uh, uh, just to finish it up. Mac? First of all, uh, Chief Meadows is Mick and, and other people. Oh, uh, one has uh, really uh, very valuable experience having served in the Congress knowing the president before he assumed role. So I think that will serve him well. But I think, uh, Mo, really, when you serve as chief of staff, uh, you, you frankly have to just somehow maintain your perspective. You have to maintain your perspective in that cauldron of, of ideas, of, of crisis, of decisions, and various tugs and pulls. Secondly, I think you have to remember why you're doing you're there to serve the president, and you're there to serve the American people. Uh, you, you, you have to keep that fundamental tenet right before you. Finally, you, you really have to keep your humanity about you. It's very easy in that swirl and demand to, to lose that sense of humanity, that sense of perspective. So uh, those, to me, are, are kind of the, the overarching themes that you, you try to keep before you in this position, which is a rare, rare privilege, and that's what legality that we have for each other position. Mac, thank you. Andy? Well, first of all, I want to thank you, Mo, for hosting us and Grace for introducing us to the program and the students that had their questions. And really appreciate being here. And what a privilege it is to be with these other chiefs of staff. And I have tremendous respect for each of them as individuals, but also for the service that they've given. Um, Number one, I would say, the fancy document that hangs on the wall that every one of us has, has United States of America, our name, calligraphy, the state we're from. It says we serve as chief of staff to the president of the United States. It's redundant in its insecurity because it says you serve at the pleasure of the chief of staff, uh, the president for the time being. But your job is not to try to please the president. If you're trying to please the president, you're not doing the job. You have to help the president and suffer the consequence if the pleasure disappears. That's the truth. So feel, be comfortable that you are not there to please the president. You're there to help the president do a job, and hopefully the president will recognize it and ask you to do the job. And when the time being arrived, say thank you for yesterday and start focusing on what's going to happen tomorrow. Because if you're stuck in yesterday, you're not going to contribute much as you go forward. The, the other thing I would say is that it really is important to be, you know, have a candid relationship with the president where you maintain a confidence and the president knows that you will keep that confidence so that you can be brutally candid and accept the consequence of it. Uh, so uh, keeping your word, your word is your bond in politics. Uh, I had the challenge of working with the Congress that flipped to Democrats and the Senate did. So we had to work very closely with the other side to get things done. It's just a reality. And um, an enemy today could be a friend tomorrow. So don't celebrate your enemies. Celebrate the relationships that are constructive and invite your enemies to become friends. And it's hard to do that in the political environment, especially during election year. But I actually respect people who have the courage to jump into the arena and get involved in the fight, even if I disagree with them. And I always tried to make that uh, well known and understood. And believe me, when Jim Jeffords switched parties and we had to negotiate with the Democrats to get the tax cuts done, and Max Baucus became my best friend, even though he had been my enemy a week before. Uh, but we got it done, and that's what makes a difference. So say thank you for inviting us. Thank you for celebrating this democracy. Everybody should get out and vote and have the courage to serve and thank those people that do have the courage to run. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Dennis. Yeah, look, uh, uh, Mo, thanks. Uh, I think you're doing great stuff. Uh, 
at the Institute of Politics at GU. So congratulations. I think La Jolla's are really fortunate to have you doing what you're doing. Uh, so hats off to you for that. Uh, for, uh, everybody turned out, to, um, especially the students and uh, the community. Um, I guess I would just say one thing, which is there's uh, this builds on uh, Andy's point, which is there, there's no knockout punches in Washington. You may think that uh, you've kind of bested somebody in a debate. You may think that you've kind of outfoxed them with some clever uh, uh, malarkey that you think that that you've pulled over them. But the fact is that these are not only your fellow countrymen, but these are people and, and women, but these are people that you're gonna have to work with uh, tomorrow or next week or next month on another issue. And so uh, I think there's a certain amount of the golden rule that I think we should probably uh, seek to infuse back in uh, uh, political uh, debate. And, um, you know, uh, that I think kind of, uh, we always thought that that started with us um, and we tried to, to live to that. And, and um, you know, as you say, uh, as Andy says, you know, you don't know that the ranking member is gonna be the ranking member forever. That ranking member, she might just become the chairman uh, before long. And so I think you ought to be ready for that. Uh, and the best way to be ready for that is to treat your, um, uh, your colleagues, your political enemies as you see them, uh, as you would anybody else. Um, and I think that's a challenge sometimes, but uh, it doesn't work any other. Dennis, thank you. Um, okay, Mick, you probably have had more opportunity to actually give this advice. Yeah. To your and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do something I don't usually do, which is dodge your question, but I'll tell you why, and then I'll <laughs> answer it a little bit. Um, Mark is a good friend of mine, for those of you who don't know, and there's no reason for you to do. Mark and I have been very close for six, eight years now. Mark is a co-founder of the Freedom Caucus with me. Um, I started talking with the president, the president started talking with me about Mark being my successor as early as last summer. Um, and I was very much in support of the decision for him to come in. Um, and I have talked to him on a regular basis. Um, because we are so close and because Washington is Washington, if I go on here tonight and say, here's what I told Mark Meadows, it may well be news tomorrow. And I don't think that's the purpose here today. So I'll say, what I'll say is this, is that um, almost all of the advice that my three colleagues would give him, um, if they had the chance, he has heard. Um, and I think Mark is, is the kind of person who can take it to heart and can be successful because um, he's an extraordinarily capable guy. There, under, under any circumstance, it can be a miserable job. I tell people it's the, the, the greatest job and the worst job all wrapped into one on any given day. But you can imagine going in in the middle of a COVID crisis, which is essentially what he did. But I think he's, uh, he's responded very well. And I, I think that the advice that these gentlemen would give him um, he has he has heard and he has and will take to heart. So again, I, I don't mean to dodge your question. I just didn't want to end up in the in Politico tomorrow. <laughs> uh, understood. Um, listen, Mac, Andy, Dennis, Mick. Uh, on behalf of everyone at the Institute of Politics and Public Service, our parent school, the McCord School of Public Policy, in the broader Georgetown community, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your uh, past and continued service uh, to, this, to this country. Um, we always say at uh, the Institute of Politics, our motto is public service is a good thing. Politics can be too. Uh, and I think just spending time talking with the four of you shows us uh, that maybe, maybe it can. Maybe, may, maybe our slogan actually is, is right. Um, to everyone who tuned in tonight, thank you so much. Um, we could have kept going for hours, um, but thank you all for sticking with us and for joining in um, our most recent vi uh, virtual forum event. Please stay tuned uh, to all of our social media channels as we begin to gear up for fall semester programming. Uh, it promises to be exciting, particularly uh, as we get ready to celebrate our fifth anniversary as an institute. So please continue to follow us at GU Politics. Um, for what's coming next. And with that, I thank you all uh, for the generosity of your time uh, and be well.